movies and stories we love are gateways to see ourselves and God in new ways. Every great story borrows its power from a larger story. The story that's written on our hearts and woven into the fabric of our very being. Hello and welcome to the Men at the Movies podcast. My name is Paul McDonald and joining me here on this Monday evening is Britt and Sarah. Hey guys, how you doing tonight? Yo, what's up my friend? Doing well, man. Chilling. No, no big, uh, no big uh, intro from Sarah this time when we did Sorry. Goonies and the Hey You Guys. <laughs> well, there really <laughs> wasn't anything like that in Lady Hawk. I mean... You know, good point good point i tried to I, i'm sorry man i'm still sick okay <laughs> <laughs> Doing the best sarah thing. is podcasting under the influence she's taking her cold <laughs> medicine but she's toughing toughing it out uh because that's just that's her level of professional dedication and her love of this movie that's right <laughs> lady hawk which came out in 85 it's got the big ones are, are Matthew Broderick and Michelle Pfeiffer and the guy. Well, actually, Matthew Broderick and Michelle Pfeiffer were not big when this movie came no, out. No, they weren't, they weren't nothing back well, then. Well, he had just, Broderick had just done War Games. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. And and Ferris Bueller didn't come out till 86. So Ferris Bueller was really the big one for, yeah. I yeah. mean, that made him a household name. Um. Michelle but, Pfeiffer had done Grease 2 and she was fresh off Scarface, fresh but off Scarface. she was perfect in this role. I mean, <laughs> oh my gosh, she is ethereal. Like every time she's on screen, she just steals it from everybody else. I mean, it's just well, she was it's like looking at the face of else. love. Yeah. And she's I mean, <laughs> no, the first reveal when they first reveal her face. It, it's just it's perfect. She was perfect, perfect for this role. Well, I, I, I saw an interview with Matthew Broderick years ago, and they were talking about this movie, or maybe just about Michelle Pfeiffer or something. And he said, yeah, we were, we were making this movie, and it was the first cast party where we were all going to meet. And he said, I'd heard about this beautiful woman that was going to be in the movie. And he said, she was like on the balcony, and I was walking up to the house where the cast party was. He said, I literally thought, that's the most beautiful woman I've ever seen in my life, you know, like, and, uh, and I mean, you know, she just, yeah, she definitely steals that part of the show in, in that respect, but she was, you know, she's a quality actress though, too. Oh, yeah. I mean, she does such a great job. I think Scarface was her first role maybe. And oh, then of it was right around the time, same time <laughs> Grease 2 came out, which uh, I will forever know, you know, the song cool writer, uh, cool because of that scene. Writer. Um, but, uh, uh, Grease two was not a great movie, but I did love it at the time because I was a huge, how dare you? I was a huge Grease fan. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's no, I'm, I'm glad you were, you were Hey man, I, I, I have no, I, I have no shame. I have Grease no shame. Grease two, Not a great movie. <laughs> no, it's not. I'm just looking up uh, Michelle Pfeiffer's IMDb page. Yeah, I know she was in, I think she was in Hollywood Nights. Um, she was. Good call. 1980. Thank you. You know where I got oh, that I one off of the podcast that I used to love, uh, 80s All Over, which no longer exists. It's very sad, but it was a fantastic Twitters. podcast where they went through 80s movies one month at a time. But Rutger Hauer wasn't the original choice. It was Kurt Russell was the original choice. And he and he read the script and thought it was going to stink. So <laughs> he was like, I don't want to do a fantasy movie. And he rejected it. So like at the last minute, they had to get they had to get somebody. And I think Rutger Hauer is perfect. I, I oh, mean, yeah, no, I think he's terrific. So if I uh, he does read somewhere they wanted Sean Connery, which I think would have been a terrible mistake. I mean, oh, it would have been like Michelle Pfeiffer's grandfather. <laughs> like, yeah, he wasn't no, that old in '85, been... though. I know, but there was still some uh, years there. Though. He was I mean... old enough. He was old enough. Um, but no, he 
But Rutger Hauer, I mean, he had just got off, come off of, uh, you know, Blade Runner. Yeah. And one of my favorite movies of, of that era, one of my favorite horror movies, The Hitcher, if you've never seen, is like is like a psychological thriller That's with Jamie some Lee bigger Curtis. names. Uh, who? Jamie Lee Curtis. No. No, I forget. You'd, re- you'd recognize who the two young people were Ooh. in it. But Rutger Hauer plays kind of this weird, really weird dark character but like he does that stoic look so well Mm -hmm. um and i think his acting is great and of course broderick was perfect is that Um, the hitcher that came out in 2007 no that's that was the remake yeah no i love that i read a couple i'm sorry i read a couple of articles where people thought that matthew broderick was like a poor choice as philippe because he came across as like 280s and that like he he was like Ferris Bueller before Ferris Bueller came out. I thought, no, I totally disagree. I thought he was fantastic as Philippe. Because like just well, that right I, little bit of humor in there, he was great. Yeah, well, I mean, and, you know, it it was at times it was a little too eighties teen, you know. But they got away with it. Like in Ferris Bueller, they took advantage of his charm by having him talk to the camera, like breaking the fourth wall. In this movie, he breaks the fourth wall by talking to God. Like, he's literally, like, yeah. it's the same sort of writing element to it where he's uh, just talking to God, but it's still the same sort of, you know, writing, you know, element to it where it's, he's narrating, giving us information, but it's in a very funny way with him and God, you know? Um, no, I, I, I love Matthew Broderick. And, you know, the other guys I don't know as well. Uh, the one, you know, you know, it's got, it does have Doc Ock in it, um, Alfred, Alfred Molina. And back when he was in Raiders of the Lost Ark, just a few years that, after that. He was, he was in so many bit parts back oh, in the I know, 80s. Totally. <laughs> and like, you see him every now and then in a movie, and you're like, oh my gosh, that's, um, he's such a fantastic it's funny that you think of him as I Doc had no Ock. idea. I had no idea he was British until I saw him in a documentary about Raiders of the Lost Ark and he's talking in this British accent. And I was like, what? <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to yeah. look to see what else he was in. He's been in yeah, a ton of been, stuff. Yeah, he's, he's been, been in a, a ton bunch. of stuff. But, a- you know, the guy who plays the bishop does a really good job. The guy who plays, also you know, Imperius. That's right. He was in War Games. Yeah. Good call. Yeah. Anyway, uh, the the cast is great, and I think the writing. We'll get into the the writing, and I think all the different layers that are in it. Um, so many arc, kind of archetypal sort of characters uh, that that they just make work. Like for its time, it was you know that medieval fantasy hadn't been quite overdone yet, you know, and yeah. and and really you can really get away with it with Lord of the Rings nowadays because it's Lord of the Rings, but you know, it's that that sort of medieval fantasy has been done so much, but um, they make it, they made it work. Yeah. They didn't take it into the bizarre, like a lot of the movies around that period did, you know, like crawl. Oh yeah. (laughs) Crawl was awful. How dare you? I like crawl. I no, you know the glaive. You know, so. we used to have the board game. Crawl the board game. Oh my! God. Oh my god! <laughs> that's, that's amazing. <laughs> Do I remember the movie? No, not at all. <laughs> Except it's got the glaive. I don't it's the glaive. Everybody remembers the glaive. Yeah. No. Um. I. I feel like they. They remained very. Um. Yeah, just uh, like sim- simplistic in the storytelling, you know, and they didn't, like I said, go overboard with a lot of, you know, magic or, you know, um, tons of, you know, characters or really complicated, you know, set pieces or monsters or anything like that. Um, I thought it was extremely well done. Like Donner's motto for a lot of his other movies is verisimilitude, very, I'm going to say this wrong, verisimilitude? I think that's as close as I'm going to get to it. Basically, it's truth in making the viewer see the movie as totally believable, even when it's, you know, pure fiction. You know, so there, that was his big catchphrase when he was filming Superman, you know, like made its way onto the poster. You'll believe a man can fly. 
you know, it's like he wants people to believe what they're seeing. Mm-hmm. That'd be a hard right turn if we pitched Lady Hawk and then talked about Superman. Oh, don't get me started, man. That's like a whole other podcast. We're not... I'd go on for hours. All right, like... so, so we've killed about 10 minutes now talking the, the trivia stuff. Um, and so what I'd like to do is play the one clip I have in the bank. I'm going to shoot the bullet early tonight. And for the five people that are still listening. And, <laughs> and so the, the, the framework for this, because this really is, is the story. It's uh, imperious, the sort of the renegade reject forlorn forgotten Bishop, not Bishop, the priest and his name's imperious. And he's basically telling Philippe what happened. Of course, Isabeau, Michelle Pfeiffer's character, and uh, Navarre fall in love. But the bishop also has uh, has designs, has has problems, has issues. He's and so I'm, instead of synopsizing the movie, I'm just going to sort of set the framework here with this, this clip as Imperius is telling uh, Philippe about their backstory – and it's coming into the story where where he says, "Oh, the bishop was in love with her too," because that's sort of that's when the love story goes awry. Because you've in the, the sort of the original plan, you've got Isabeau and Navarre; they fall in love. He's the captain of the guard; she's the face of love, and they're all everything goes great until the bishop not only falls in love with her but realizes that they are in love with each other. Even his grace, the bishop, could think of nothing else. The bishop loved her? As near as that evil man could come to it. His passion was a sort of madness. He was a man possessed. But Isabeau sensed his wickedness, and she shrank from him. She sent back all his letters and opened his poems and read. Her heart was already lost, you see, to the captain of the guard. Etienne Navarre. The bishop knew nothing of their love, but every day he saw it grow stronger and deeper and richer. Until. Until? They were betrayed. They shared the same confessor, a weak and foolish priest. And one day in a drunken confession to his superior, he committed a mortal sin. He revealed the lover's secret vows to the bishop. The old fool didn't realize what he had done at first, nor the terrible revenge the bishop would take. His grace seemed to go mad. He lost both his sanctity and his reason. He swore that if he could not have her, no man would. So Navarre and Isabeau fled from Aquila. But the bishop followed never more than an hour behind and more persistent than a hound. An evil man, a powerful man, hated and feared, rejected even by Rome herself. He called upon the powers of darkness for the means to damn the lovers. In his fury and frustration, he struck a dreadful bargain with the evil one. The dark powers of hell spat up a terrible curse, and you have seen it working. By day, Isabeau is the beautiful bird you brought to me. And by night, as you have already guessed, the voice of the wolf that we hear is the cry of Navarre. Poor dumb creatures with no memory of the half-life of their human existence, never touching in the flesh, Only the anguish of a split second at sunrise and sunset when they can almost touch, but not. Always together, eternally apart. As long as the sun rises and sets, as long as there is day and night, and for as long as they both shall live. You have stumbled onto a tragic story, Philippe Gaston, 
And now, whether you like it or not, you are lost in it with the rest of us. So, Sarah, because this was this was one of your early chapters of your book that you're working on. So why this movie? What what especially from that sort of synopsis summation of the movie? Uh, what jumps out to you as saying this is what resonates? This is why uh, I love this movie. Well, what first attracted me to it, um, you know, when I first saw it when I was younger was that there's sort of a Beauty and the Beast aspect to it, which was my favorite fairy tale growing up. And uh, so that was what drew me in. And, um, you know, it's such a tragic love story, you know, that, you know, they're, they're, like he says, they're always together and eternally apart. And, you know, it's like they, they have to stay together because if they don't, you know, what else do they have? You know, and, and um, you know, so that that really spoke to me, you know, just the level of that commitment, you know, and, and it's not like they could talk to each other or, you know, be like, you know, look, I can't do this anymore. I'm leaving you, you know, type thing. They could, they, they couldn't even communicate with each other. It's just was sort of an unspoken thing. You know, it's like, no, I've got to stay with him and I've got to stay with her because if I don't, you know, I have, I have nothing else. And, um, you know, that, and then just the, the, it's just a beautifully shot movie. You know, I love the whole medieval backdrop and I love the character of Philippe and his relationship with God and the way that he just talks to him through the whole movie. And, you know, I think that, that they did a really good job, you know, with that, because that's not something that you see in a whole lot of movies, you know, even Christian movies, you know, like people just having that sort of casual, intimate, genuine friendship with God where he's, he's talking to him like you would talk to a friend. Like he, he, you know, asks him for help. He goes to him when he's afraid. He asks him frank questions like, God, why are you doing this? You know, it's like, I don't want this. I don't get it. I don't understand what you're saying. He's very free to be honest with God about what he's feeling and when he doesn't understand something. But at the same time, he trusts that God's brought him into this. And so he's going to bring him out too. You know, it's just a really beautiful thing. I love it. Yeah, that probably my favorite line he has after he pickpockets while he's in the water. He says, I know I promised, Lord, never again, but I also know that you know what a weak willed person I am. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's terrific. Yeah. He's got some great lines. <laughs> yeah, they, they definitely gave the best lines to the to the mouse there. <laughs> where's the woman she flew away what god's truth she flew away <laughs> <laughs> so and, and you sort of touched on a couple of the directions we're going to go so so brit kind of pitching the the question to you what is it that you love about this movie when you look back now almost 40 years i was told it's there'd be getting no math close today. Yeah, um, I said close. almost. Wow. Next, so going uh, next back, you know, when we years. were when we were adolescent boys watching this movie. Well, I mean, uh, it's it's at its core, it's a romance. At, at its core, it's a romantic movie, but it's not a romance, a romantic movie in the classic sense of like there's a meet cute and then there's the development of stuff like like they're they're already in love and they're already kind of stuck in this tragic story and there's kind of it's kind of a magical thing but it, it's a very like sarah was saying it's a very simple setup you know uh that that they allow philippe to discover the setup you know i mean it's pretty it's pretty obvious and in any any sort of description of the movie will tell you the setup but uh, but yeah i name. mean as a young as <laughs> it's in the name but but as the as the you know as, as the movie progresses uh, you know you really get a sense of character you get a sense of longing and and like a lot of these like universal really things and when i was a kid it was it was the humor of matthew broderick along with the the heroism of you know the 
you know, the Navarre character, but I, you know, I was also a believer as a young kid. So I appreciated the, the, that they involve God in the story. God gives, you know, the monk, the, 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 the priest, the fallen priest, a dream and it gives him, you know, like it's, but it's not like a, you know, it's just, it's not just like throw away. God's going to fix everything moment either. Like it's, this is what God's is saying to do. Now we got to do that as crazy as it looks, as much as we might, we might think there's no way that can happen. How can there be a day without a night and a night without a day? And of course, you know, as a kid, you're like, Oh yeah. And then clips and, you know, you just get all sort of like, that's awesome. And as just, just all of those elements that were simple, but I think as we'll get into maybe, uh, there's a lot of powerful layers to it, uh, at the same time. And, and to me, that's good writing. You know, if you can, it can be simple writing, if the stakes mean something, if the stakes really mean something and the story and the characters are fleshed out enough that you care what happens to these people. And, and I think that they've done that. And, um, so, so it's interesting cause you said that, and then it made me think, why do we care? Navarre is not a likable dude and we don't really get to know. Michelle Pfeiffer's character, Isabeau. But why do we care about them? We care about them because Mouse cares about them. Philippe Gaston, he he revealed. We see their character through him. He gets as he, right. as the the monk says, "You've get, gotten pulled into this tragic story." Do you have well? Something? Well, there, yeah. there there is a there is a save the cat moment with Navarre in the beginning because he saves Philippe, right? And when he's fight when he's fighting those other, you know, the, when he's fighting those, <laughs> well, when, when he's fighting those other soldiers, he makes a point not to kill them. Mm -hmm. Like he he doesn't he didn't mean to kill the one guy. Like someone else pushed him into doing it. Yeah. You know, like and so yes, he's he's gruff and maybe not likable, but at the same time, you you still get through his actions. He's a he's a person of honor. He's capable. He's so capable. He can beat people without killing them. You know, all of those sort of things that they don't say out loud, but they show you show don't tell. And uh, and the fact that he he says Philippe twice or three times. How many times did he say this guy? Every time. Um, every time. <laughs> and even as a, even as a wolf, he saves fully. Right. Yeah. Like, 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 yeah. he, like, so he's, he's, he's heroic and he's honorable and yet he's still misdirected. He still believes a lie and needs to come back to the truth of, of, of who he is and, and what can happen. So here's what we're going to talk about for the, the rest of the time. We're, we're, almost half an hour in and now I'm going to, we're going to frame up because you've got this, these, these parallels, not, but they're not really parallels. It, the appearances, you've got the, the false religion as evidenced in the, the character of the Bishop. And then contrasted that with Philippe's relationship with God, as you were mentioning, Sarah, his friendship, his relationship, his, his close personal walk with, with God, We've got that contrast, which I think sort of leads into the other big thing that we see in how as um, as Navarre and Isabel long for intimacy but constantly fail. And we know that I, one of my one of my friends said, he says, loneliness is when the expectation of our relationship is greater than the reality of the relationship. And that gap is loneliness. And we have that whether it's friends, whether it's work, whether it's with our with our spouses, with our partners. There's always there's I can't say always, but there's almost always going to be a gap, whether it's in and there's a communication, there's expectation, there's just this gap. And uh, try as we might, we fail to reach it, which also parallels the gospel. Try as try as hard as we can, we're not gonna reach God. And so what what actually brings us together is a supernatural event um not to over spiritualize it but that's sort of what we do so how does that sound for a framework moving forward <laughs> sure 
<laughs> yeah. Seriously, I mean, NyQuil coma. Uh, no. You know, <laughs> I mean, you know, one of the things I love about it is, uh, again, they're, they these are universal ideas that j- draw us in and help. Uh, we, we've all been in the position to some degree where a religious mindset has abused us. We've all been there. That is that is something all of us can relate to. Even Jesus can relate to it. Even <laughs> Jesus had yeah. to deal yeah. with people, even though he did nothing wrong. Uh, the Romans were not against him. I mean, it was right. Pilate was like, I don't care what happened. You know, I wash my um, hands, take him back. You deal with them. But He's it was it was it, it was the very people who claimed and and man, just read like Luke 12 or low to the Pharisees. I mean, like Jesus gave these guys the hardest time because he was like, you guys are the ones who should know better. And yet you're greedy and you're this and you're that. And. And I'm telling you, it's what makes the Gospels attractive to us. We're like, yeah, there are people who have religious power and they pass by the the, the guy who's lying dead on the road. Uh, And and we know that this is that this is the world that we live in. And so they 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 give us that in the bishop who uh, like this is really weird moment where he's watching this girl dance. And I'm like. I th- you know, it's like, I thought you were supposed to be celibate, Ew. man. Like, you know, like, Ew. it's just really I- it's icky, right? Yeah. But so they they do a great job making him look just, but the devil loves religious activity without the presence of God. The, the, the devil loves that because that is the ultimate lie. That's the ultimate lie that you can have a religious, good, moral life. That's the that's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, like that you can have this without God, without an actual relationship with God. And yet what we see in these other two characters, as broken as they are, they have an actual relationship with God and they redeem the design that's supposed to happen between the man and the woman as broken as they are, because they actually have a relationship with God. They are able to redeem this and and that's and so i love that contrast in this movie because it's been my experience you know i was telling the church yes uh, yesterday yeah right today's monday i was telling the church <laughs> yesterday i was like man anybody who tells you that you're not that you're not supposed to hear the voice of god if there's anybody who tells you and if especially if they're a, a, a pastor or a christian or a minister run yeah. Like, I don't know who I don't know who I would be without hearing the voice of God. I don't know. I, I would. I don't know. But I wouldn't be this. I would and I, be on I, this I, podcast I, without hearing the voice. I, of God. I mean, I, <laughs> I like and I, my sheep know me. My sheep hear my voice. You know, like this is this is this is like the Bible wouldn't exist without somebody being able to hear God's voice like this. Like, like this just like this. That's what make gives it authority is because people heard from God and didn't speak from their own authority. Uh, they didn't figure it out. God told them, gave them revelation. And, and this is just as core to the new, you know, like we, we really think Jesus, that God sent his son to earth to be among us, Emmanuel to not talk to us. Like, we really think that that's like, really like the, the veil was torn and like all this enmity between us and God was, was, was broken down. So, we won't talk. I mean, I just don't get it. I just don't get it how anyone would, but people do say this, like, no, you can't, you really can't hear it. Just read the Bible. You can't hear the voice of God. And, um, but so I love that contrast here where as broken as they are, they have, they communicate with God. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. You contrast that with, the and even dude, there's some like old hymns, worship songs, whatever. Who that's all like these and thous, and it just it it it's cringy to me. I understand there's people who find that extremely worshipful and respectful, and that brings them into the presence of God. And for me, it just it feels like that religious voice that's 
keeping me away or like you just said, almost like a religious pride of look how good we are. Now, Sarah, because you know, you've, as you do, you've got the t-shirt on. Yes, you're do. wearing the, you're, or you're not wearing the novelization. You've read well. the novelization. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what, like, cause you, this is something you, you brought out in your notes as well, that, that contrast again, between the bishop, the, the religion of the bishop and the religion of Philippe. Yeah. Um, cause I mean, the bishop is supposed to be a man of God and obviously is like the furthest thing from a true man of God ever because, you know, I mean, he's got a mistress. He like taxes the populace to death just so that he can keep himself in, you know, silks and jewels. Um, he's lusting after Isabeau, you know, um, he has zero mercy or empathy for anybody. And then he makes a deal with the devil to curse the couple because if he can't have her no man will you know and <laughs> it one of the like this is why i just love reading movie novelizations because it's like you find out so many things about the characters that you don't watch the movie i mean part of the deal that the bishop made with the devil was to protect his own soul so he his soul apparently according to the terms of the curse he will never like go to hell as long as the curse remains on the couple unbroken. So that's part of the reason why he goes to such extremes to make sure that they stay cursed, because as long as they stay cursed, he's safe from hell and stuff. And um, the movie actually ends when, you know, Navarre, you know, kills him. And then he actually turns into a wolf, you know, like this, like old scraggy wolf and, you know, kind of runs away and stuff like that. But, um, so he, throughout the course of the book, he just feels free to carry out all of these unspeakable crimes and do these terrible things. Cause he's like, Hey, I'm not going to catch anything for this. I can do whatever the heck I want. <laughs> it's like, so, so that hmm. was, you know, very interesting. Um, and then Navarre, the character of Navarre, meanwhile, his family has served the church for five generations, and his whole legacy and history is bound up in serving God and serving the church, you know, and, and loyalty and fealty. And so then when he's called to serve under this really unholy bishop and has to do, you know, acts of cruelty to people in the bishop's name he does it because in his eyes the bishop is speaking for god and he's trying to stay faithful and so and the only reason he rebels against that is because he falls in love with isabeau and the bishop tries to take her away from him and stuff and so then when he, they get when they both get cursed he loses his faith in god and just becomes consumed with revenge you know and stuff and it takes the curse being broken to to bring his faith back um and, you know, part of that is Philippe. And it's funny, you were saying, Britt, you know, like you were, you know, you you were a Christian when you first saw this movie growing up. I was not um, because I was brought up in the Roman Catholic Church. And I'm not saying that Roman Catholics aren't Christian because I've known many that you know, are t wonderful yeah. Jesus lovers. <laughs> we don't. We don't. Yeah, me too. Speaking of speaking of works of the enemy, division is the primary one. I yes. Think. Yes. Yeah, right. 100%. Um, but. My personal, you know, religion at that point was just, you know, my parents making us go to church on Sunday. I actually went to a Catholic private school for a while. And, you know, it was just it was just a lot of rote, you know, to me. It was just, you know, like and this when this movie takes place, this was obviously like before the Reformation and Martin Luther and stuff. So at that point, a lot of these peasants who were going to church didn't even understand what was happening because all the, the, the masses were in Latin and these peasants didn't speak Latin, you know, so they were just, you know, up there like speaking gibberish basically, which they were forced to go to because it was the law. So you <laughs> like, how miserable is that? You know? So, and so, and so then you've got Philippe, and then this was like, I think another thing that fascinated me because I'm like, you know, 10 years old watching this and there's this guy in the movie having this extremely casual friendship with God, which I had no inkling of at that time. So that was kind of strange mm -hmm. and odd to see portrayed that way. But in the book, you find out Philippe was born 
in a prison because his mother was hanged for stealing bread. So as soon as she had him, they took her off and killed her. And then he was raised in a monastery for the first, I don't know, like 10 years of his life or so where, you know, he was taught how to read and write and, you know, learned about God and stuff, but he ran away because they would beat him, you know, as a discipline. And yet he still was able to develop this really terrific, you know, intimate friendship with God where it, like there's times in the movie where he's like, oh, Lord, don't let that thing be coming at me be what I think it is, you know, but he's still able to be like, <laughs> but he's still able to say no hard feelings, of course, but, you know, I'll be really disappointed, you know, right. <laughs> so, yeah. so he's still like showing respect to God being like, hey, your will, whatever, I'm just gonna be really sad. <laughs> and he's able to ask him honest questions like, Lord, I told the truth. How can I t learn any moral lessons if you keep confusing me? You know? <laughs> <laughs> and stuff. And, um, you know, he's just very open and frank with God, like, oh, I don't know what this story is. I beg you not to make me a part of it, you know, and stuff. And but I mean, he also trusts God, you know, and, and you know, trusts that he's going to take care of them. And and then and that gives Philippe the freedom to be very honest in his relationship with God, not just with his questions, but about who he is as a person, because he's able to say to God, yes, I'm a thief. I'm a liar. You know this, you know, like, like you were saying earlier, Paul, like, you know what a weak willed person I am <laughs> yes. and stuff. And he's, he's not afraid. He doesn't try to hide from God. Um, you know, and, and, and I think that makes him a bit more open when imperious, you know, reveals to him that he's found a way to break the curse. And so I feel like God really used Philippe as a go between, you know, between Navarre and Imperius because Navarre wouldn't have listened to Imperius just on his own because Imperius betrayed them, mm -hmm. you know, and he was very angry, rightly so, at him. And, but he took Philippe and, you know, his belief and his faith and his loyalty, not just to God, but to Navarre and Isabeau. To be like, no, let's let's give him a chance. Let's see, you know, what have you got to lose? It might work, you know, and stuff. And so he brought him in at literally just the right time, you know, like right before the eclipse happened and, you know, was able to, to really use him in a variety of ways, spiritual, physical, you know, emotional, to, to be a bridge and stuff. And I love it when when God sends us people in our lives to be that bridge, you know, and, and show us God in a way that we haven't seen before and stuff. Cause I know that he did that for me and it just, I mean, it radically changed my life. You know, it was just, it was just incredible. Yeah. There, there's this, you know, we can get into it. There's this, there's this distance and tragic distance between two people who love each other, right. Navarre and Isabeau. And part of the redemption is someone, like you said, being the bridge. Like they can't communicate with each other. And and yet it shows the power of community. It shows the power of, yeah. of, of, how, com of how community can say, no, she actually really loves you. You know that, right? <laughs> you know, uh, uh, you, you, you guys keep missing each other. You guys keep talking uh, beyond each other. And and if that's all it was, then if that's all you have, then then you're isolated and you're alone from each other. But when but when you have a community or people or, or the, when there are people in your life who can go, well, you know, he actually really loves you like he would do anything for you. And Philippe kind of just makes it up, but he's not really making it up like the heart of what he's saying is true. Yeah. Even though he's like, he makes it poetic and he's like, oh, he said, he gives us her, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, but which makes it fun and funny. But at the same time, like we need that's why one of the reasons we need community in a good way is 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 because that's part of the reconciliation is that we're meant to have community. And that's what they have at the end, you know, that that once once the man and the woman kind of see each other as they are and break the curse like you see this stoic guy very affectionate toward philippe and very affectionate toward imperious and like and like so he he's he's gone from revenge to very affectionate and 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 that's 
that's being a full man. Being a full man is a guy who can who can fight with a sword, but is also very tender at the same time and can be very gentle and tender. And so you, you finally see that in him instead of the wolf, right? You know, like this is this archetype of 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 who he is and and, and they, we can't communicate because i'm a wolf you know um and You're seeing the man that isabeau fell in love with in the first place exactly and and so but again like you said philippe is that is that kind of intermediary between them where he's able to translate you know you see you you can't see each other for who you really are because of the curse and that was the curse that's part of the curse of the garden. The curse after the garden was enmity between man and wife. They were meant to work together and complement one another and be partners in mission, but, and, you know, be fruitful, multiply and all that fun stuff um, out of intimacy. But part of the curse is I'm going to put this thing between you. In your husband, I'm going to put this thing between you and the land. I'm going to put this thing. Now, there's this distance now between you and God. You got to cover yourself. You're, you know, you're, you know, like there's, there's distance and separation instead of wholeness and unity. And that's what, and that's what makes what Christ did on the cross and the splitting of the, of the veil between the Holy of Holies and the, you know, just it's, it's all open now. It's for anybody who would come. Uh, and it's not, it's not, and, and that's why that's real relationship. And, um, and, and I just think that that's a universal thing about this movie is I think as, as much as we desire relationship and connection and intimacy, our movies, our songs, the pop songs, everything is like centered around this, like, I'm going to love you forever. Right. <laughs> like, and, but but we fail so often at that. And, and it's because, you know, it's, it, there's this disconnect that, that where we don't want to be vulnerable or we, we, you know, we believe lies about each other. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie, the breakup and it's not a great movie, but it had Vince Vaughn and Jennifer Aniston in it. And there's a scene in the beginning where they have this huge fight and as tragic as the scene is, it's one of the best written scenes ever because they're both talking, but they're not saying what they really mean. They're not being vulnerable with enough, with each other about how they really feel and, and putting themselves out there. They're just, they're just, they're miscommunicating every, everything they say is misheard and miscommunicated and and then that leads to the tragedy of the movie about the breakup and so i think we can all relate to that you know um wanting that intimacy but feeling like well when i'm ready he's a wolf right when i'm ready to talk he's a wolf or when i'm ready to talk she flies away uh you know and and, and i you know i think we can relate to that those sort of ideas um, but then in the light, in, in a, like you said, Paul, like in, in, a, in a supernatural way in Christ, we can we have the security of God's love in, in order to be real with each other and find that intimacy and, and return back to that purpose driven relationship and intimacy that we can have. And that's not just men and women, like you said, like it can be other sort of relationships, too. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I love it. I was really feeling for Isabeau, just like picturing what her life must have been like, because I mean, at least Navarre's a man during the day, so he's able to go around and like talk to people that he meets and stuff, and it's like, it's, right. it's pretty normal for him to have, you know, like a hawk and stuff, that was a normal thing at that point. She's a woman all by herself at night always at night you know so you don't know who like what kind of bad guys are like out there in the dark you know it's not safe for her to to go around very many people because she's a woman with no protector you know in the in medieval times you know like carla hope I mean, no to, clothes what would kill you in medieval, huh she's what? a hawk so she doesn't even have clothes yeah you know and it's like you know like what carla hoke says about medieval times hey you know what would kill you in medieval times everything 
you know, (laughs) you know, so she has no protector. She's a woman by herself, always at night. And she's sure she's got a big scary wolf, you know, dog in her the whole time. But that also ensures that she can never be around civilized people because she's got a big scary wolf, you know, hanging around with her. So she is constantly, constantly, constantly alone, like totally by herself, you know, and like she's in the most committed relationship ever and she has nothing to show for it but utter and complete loneliness which is why when philippe finally shows up it's like a massive relief and breath of fresh air like oh you're his friend you travel with him finally somebody to talk to you know please tell me about him what has he said where are we going what are we doing you know it's just like what does he say about me you know it's like so and and he and he does the same thing what does she say yeah did you talk to her you know what did she say and you, you you know i think a lot of people can relate to this reality that you can be married and live in the same house and feel utterly and completely alone. In yeah. fact, maybe more alone than you did when you were single. Yeah. Because you you are in the presence of something that should give you comfort and yet doesn't. It should give you intimacy and yet that that's not what's happening. And I think a lot of people can relate to that or maybe they've been in that situation or you know, you can live in a house and still feel completely alone. And, and, you know, there's this myth that going back to the whole Philippe thing, there's this myth that the divorce rate in the church is the same as in outside the people who don't go to church. It's a myth. It's a lie. It's not true. Uh, it, the, the data shows that, that married couples who regularly attend a church have much lower that the, the, that the divorce rate among those couples are, are much lower. It's not that they never get divorced, um, but it, it's much higher among people, couples who don't go to church. Like literally being in a faith community can do this, can be like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. You really think she believes that about you? You know, like, uh, you know, being, being at where, where, you know, now again, that, that doesn't mean it, it's not like a foolproof plan. Like if I go to church, I'll never get divorced, but uh, it, that's not what the data shows. But, but it, it's something that the world has tried to say that like non-Christians put this out there. Well, see, it doesn't matter if you go to church, it's, you know, Christians are just as bad as everybody else, you know, blah, 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 blah. They get divorced just as the same rate of it. That's not true. And pastors for years would repeat this then maybe some still do and because it because they heard it somewhere but the data does just doesn't show that that if that if you're in a community where where you can be vulnerable enough and let people into your life that it can help you save a marriage uh or or, or get through those tough times when you would normally have punted or you know hit the eject button i was just gonna say like actually going back to the Romance of the Stone podcast that I just did with Paul. I'm not going to take up all of our time, you know, talking about it, but just (laughs) we touched a little bit on, you know, that loneliness, you know, and seeking that in a person in that as well. And, um, you know, I encourage people to go back and listen to that because I talk about, you know, being a single person, you know, like I've never been in a relationship, you know, I've never had a boyfriend. I've been single my entire life and I'm 48 years old, you know, and so it took me a long time to come to that place to realize that I could be happy and not have to be in a relationship to be happy, you know, that I could, you know, like find that satisfaction in God, you know, and stuff Mm -hmm. and in the community that he's put me in because, you know, it's like, I have a family here. I have people who care about me, you know, and, and, and stuff like that, that I can, you know, I can reach out to and that reach out to me when I need it, you know, and stuff. So yeah, definitely. That's great. It is. <laughs> so I keep seeing this, this idea of that gap, that what is loneliness where it's, as you were saying, Britt, you were talking about even in a marriage, you can be lonely. Because what you expect you know, what, from that relationship, from your wife, from your husband, what you expect falls short of what it is. 
I thought mm. it'd be like this, but it's not. And in that gap, you have loneliness. I thought it'd be we'd have this level of intimacy. And I don't just I don't mean physical, but I mean like personal relational intimacy. And it's not. What am I going to do with that? It could be with friends. Hey, I thought I'd have this sort of friendship. And, you know, not to use the other one, he's just not that into you. You know what? It's like, <laughs> oh, I really want to be friends with this person. I'm not, they're not sending me that same signal. And it's kind of a bummer. And even with God, I thought walking with God would be like this. And it's not. I thought it, uh, reading through Acts and, you know, we, we all know the story of Paul He's heading to Damascus, gets knocked off his horse, talks to Jesus, and you know has a radical conversion story. And immediately, his life is in danger. It's like, I'm not sure I was talking to God because I think if it was talking to God, I wouldn't like be running for my life, sort of thing. So he leaves Damascus, goes to Jerusalem, where a whole different group of people want to kill him. Walking with God, where people want to kill you every day. And it's not but, the best ad campaign. No, it's it's terrible. <laughs> and it's right there in Acts. It's like their their star pupil, right? Paul in the New Testament wrote most of it. He's like, Yeah, he's gonna get and and oh man. I gotta what? look up. Hang on. I get to edit silence out, so shut up. <laughs> Um, before so Paul's in Damascus he can't see God as you, as we were talking about with Philippe God talks to Ananias hey, hey go see Paul actually let, let me look it up because I think this is really this will head towards a bow it's a bow. Ha <laughs> See what I did there? <laughs> so in Acts 9, it says, there's a believer in Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord spoke to him in a vision saying, Ananias, it's a good start. God knows my name. Yes, Lord, he replied. The Lord said, go over to Straight Street to the house of Judas. When you get there, ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. He's praying to me right now. I have shown him a vision of a man named Ananias coming in and laying hands on him so he can see again. And Ananias' response sounds just like Philippe's would. Uh, but Lord, exclaimed Ananias, <laughs> I've heard many people talk about the terrible things this man has done to believers in Jerusalem. He's a th he's, and he's authorized by the priest to arrest everyone who calls on his name, on your name. Like very Philippish as yeah, he's yeah. as he's responding. Uh, uh, this doesn't sure? seem like a great idea, God. Yeah, I, I but the Lord disagree. said, "But the Lord said, go, for Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to kings as well as to the people of Israel, and I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake." That's not a verse that gets preached on a lot. No. Nope. Yeah. <laughs> Again, nope. not a great ad campaign. Join me <laughs> and suffer. Yeah, but, <laughs> yeah, but but Jesus, but Jesus said the same thing. They hated me first. They're gonna hate you. Yeah. So come on and follow me. But but again, th but there's a promise with that. There, the you know the promise <laughs> with in this world you will have trouble. And I've told you this beforehand. So when it happened, it wouldn't surprise you that like, like I'm going to tell you that this is going to suck at times, because if I told you it was all going to be unicorns and, and poop and rainbows, that <laughs> that if, if I told you that that's Wait, what it was, the then... unicorns poop and rainbows or am I? Yes. Poop and rainbows? <laughs> Uh, say, either one. Meant, but it sounded like <laughs> a unicorn. Either one. I just had a colonoscopy. Rainbows. I guarantee you I was that, not pooping rainbows. Uh <laughs> that if if that's all it was, if that's what you thought it, if you if that's what you thought this was going to be and then there's hard times, you that's it. You 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 eject. You're out. But if I tell you ahead of time there's going to be times that this is going to suck. But don't worry because I've overcome the world. 
I've overcome not just the problems in the world, but the world, the problems are in. Like I've overcome the whole thing. So yes, you're going to go through hard times. Yes, you're going to go through this stuff. And yes, there are going to be a lot of things that aren't fun. But don't worry, I'm going to be with you. And in the end, you're going to overcome all of it. There's going to be, there's victory. But you, you got, but you got to stick. You got to stick. It's he who endures to the end will be saved. Like you got to stick with this and, and not, and not give up. And so, so here's something that, that I tell married people or people who are getting married, you know, cause I do some premarital counseling every now and then. And um, so, and I think this relates to the movie, the end of the movie, because what a lot of times what happens is when we start to have conflict in a marriage or really, or really you, you could say with friends, close friends, or in any sort of close relationship, you have to stop and say, you're not my enemy. You have to stop and, and tell yourself the truth and tell each other the truth. I love you and you're not the enemy. So what we have to do is realize there's an enemy outside of us that's trying to get us to divide. So, so now how are we going to fight together against him? How are we going to fight together against this enemy that's trying to divide us? And that's what they do at the end of the movie. They stand together. Look at me. Look at we're here against you. Right. And that breaks that curse. That breaks that curse. And so what, what happens often is we treat each other like the enemy Be, because we because we're not perfect and we do make mistakes. Okay. And so, and so we, we have to forgive and we have to ask for forgiveness and all that sort of stuff like that, that has to happen, but there, there has to be a moment where, cause in the middle of it, you're trying to fight and you're trying to get yours and you're trying to like, make sure you survive and, and you're the wolf or you got to make sure or, this doesn't happen again. Or that she like, respects literally, me. literally the wolf and the and the hawk are fight or flight. Literally, <laughs> literally, we've got fight or flight, right? But in, instead, be instead instead be still, and know that I am God. Just stop, and 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 mm. and and tell each other the truth. I love you. I'm for you. And how how can we together? face this problem as one how can we do this together and and then what happens is you you break the lie you break the lie and the enemy is now powerless against you because you've broken the lie and that's what happens at the end of the movie you kind of just really nicely encapsulated like imperious and navarre's whole conflict there yes too, because you know it's like he was a trusted confidant of both him and Isabeau, and he betrayed them, unfortunately. Um, he asks for forgiveness, you know, yes. um, and Navarre has to, like, come to the point where he realizes that Imperius isn't his enemy and that he's legit trying to help them, you know, and when he finally does come to that point and trusts him, you know, he is, yeah, like you said, able to stand with Isabeau and break the curse. And he had to see how he hurt Philippe in the middle of the night when yeah, Philippe was trying to yeah. like Philippe was trying to save him. And he was like, how did you get hurt? Was that me? Like sometimes we don't mm. get when we hurt people. Yeah. Right. We don't get it until we see it. And it's like, Oh, and, and then you see Navarre's heart soften towards him. Like, okay, now I'm willing yeah. to listen. That's a beautiful I, I, scene. You know? And, but again, it, it, it's, it's, it's all s archetypes and, but but it's so universal that we want that community. We want to have a community of people that we know we can trust and are going to be for us no matter what. And that's what we have again. Right, Paul? We keep showing it right at the end of the movie. That's what we have. We have a community. We have family. E even all out these, of these all these people, people in the church just watching Navarre kill <laughs> that's, left and right with not right. moving or two. That is the like. weird. That's the weirdest part of the movie to me. <laughs> exceedingly weird. Like, I no, agree. no police coming in for these <laughs> deaths. No, nothing. Just like they're all just sitting there going, just gonna dance around. I love you. 
So well, I want to go back. This, are you kidding? That was probably the most exciting thing that ever happened during a mass, like ever. Right? <laughs> True. <laughs> ooh, ooh, a show. This is different. <laughs> this is some good incense, baby. Although I want to go back to Ananias for a second, because it, because as you were talking, Britt, I I started chuckling because I just wanted to say this because. I feel like he's sort of like uh, Miracle Max. <laughs> God's like, he's like, yeah, that's, he said true. He said to bluff. He said to blave. He's like, no, I'm going to show him how much he's going to suffer. Oh, he's going to suffer? Suffering's galore. I'm on the case. <laughs> he's like, I'm going to show him how much he suffered. And Ananias went. <laughs> I'm not a bitch, I'm your wife. <laughs> <laughs> so, That's awesome. Yeah. But all right, any any last thoughts? We've we tripped an hour. So any any last thoughts? I think Britt, you you did a pretty good summation there. I think he wrapped it up beautifully. I don't have anything to add, actually. All right. Well, Britt and Sarah, thank you guys for coming on and talking on Lady Hawk coordinating, getting together. You're both here, both present. No one's no one's a fighter, a flight hawker, a wolf. We're all good. <laughs> so this has been Paul McDonald, Sarah Daniels, and Britt Mooney talking about Lady Hawk. Uh, check it out. Uh, it it won a couple of Academy Awards, so it's not all bad. Except Hopefully, for Alan Parsons score. <laughs> <laughs> Can, can we have a petition where they remix that movie really? with yes. actual orchestration? Can we please? <laughs> I mean, Richard Donner's dead. He doesn't care anymore. <laughs> can 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 we can we like like do a GoFundMe and pay Hans Zimmer or somebody to go in there and like score this thing? There's got to be a you, fan edit out there somewhere can that can make this happen. <laughs> it, it, it would go. It, it would go on a whole other level. I'm telling you. Mm-hmm. Agree, hundred <laughs> percent. All right, so we hope you enjoyed it. I, mean, I got nothing to add, and I hope you join us next time here on the Men at the Movies podcast. Something inside has been awakened. I can no longer be who I was before. But if I am no longer who I was, who am I to be?